This is the Story of Punks podcast, the show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. I'm your host, Cindy Grigg. This is episode 57, and it's part one of two. 58 will continue this conversation with diesel punk and deco punk, author, artist, director, all kinds of artistic names I could attribute to Todd Downing. And I'm so excited to speak with Todd about his Airship Daedalus series. Audible is sponsoring both of these episodes of the Story Punks podcast. So you can find Todd Downing's audiobooks through Audible. Go check out my running list over at storypunks.world forward slash audible. As far as my personal update, I have been applying the edits from my editor (laughs) for my upcoming beta read offering over at Patreon. And that again is at patreon.com forward slash storypunks. That will be novel number one in my super saga, Peacock Levine and the Ethereum Fates of Nought. That is the lay of the land over here. Just as a reminder, kind of telling you all the stuff that's coming up. And one of those things that I want to touch on is um, what what it's going to be like when the show isn't running for that off period between September to next April. And if you want more story punks during that time, then please come over to Patreon. Because if you throw in a little bit of patronage, you know, a tip or whatever you want to call it, you will be able to access everything that I am sharing with the patrons during the off season. And part of the goal there is for me to get to my first milestone, which is $1,000 of support a month. And that way we can run the show year round. So I know this is repeat for anyone who has been following episode to episode. But I just wanted to mention it in case people are working backward, and they haven't made it to that yet. And due to some new scheduling that I hadn't anticipated this week, I will be publishing 57 this week, 58 next week. Pretty much all I can do. (laughs) And I'm going to do that with the next two episodes as well. I just don't have as much time because some of my day gigs have picked up speed. And so I will be publishing them that way. But guess what? We're still done early. So I will be finishing episode 60 the last week of August. That's how that goes. So you will get part one this week, part two next week. So on that note, I think we better get right back to the deco age of the 1920s, 1930s, and um, talk about deco punk and diesel punk and all these amazing things. Here's part one of two of my interview with Todd Downing. A child of the 70s and 80s, I have been building worlds and telling stories all my life. Professionally, since my late teens, I take my craft seriously, honing both core and support skills as necessary to create the most immersive literary or audiovisual experiences possible. Imagination is my canvas, ones and zeros my brush. Whether crafting interactive experiences like tabletop role-playing settings or creating dynamic characters through narrative fiction or voiceover, it is my ultimate goal to create products which entertain and engage while they challenge and inform. And I hope to continue creating compelling and entertaining content for the rest of my life. Todd Downing, it is a pleasure to have you on the Story Points podcast today. It is a pleasure to be here (laughs) well that's good to hear because (laughs) we have a lot of cool stuff to talk about how's your day going other than you know technical Uh, stuff oh uh it uh we have a a brand new dog was a rescue from a texas uh kill shelter and uh so she's kind of new so we're bonding I was going to say, that's an important window. I have fostered kittens and so you get a whole litter of kittens and yeah, you have to kind of be their first contact in that new environment or something. Exactly. It looks really cool with all those pictures behind you. Oh, that's um, that's some of my poster work. This is in my office slash studio. I have a, a reading chair and kind of surrounded by art and props. Things like that. I actually have, I should show you this. Uh, I have an inflatable pteranodon in the corner over my workstation. 
which, uh, because, of course well, I have actually had that thing for like 25 years. It's, uh, it was a gift from my parents when I first, I got my first job in the um, video game industry. And, uh, that's, that's always been over my workstation, wherever I worked. Pretty cool to have parents that get it. And then <laughs> know to get you that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing really well. Thank you for asking. Yeah. It was just crazy. Um, I should be used to tech glitches by now, Yeah, but my first season was like so smooth that I was really lucky. And now it's almost every episode, something super weird happens. Like right. today I just walk in and, and I don't have a picture. I go around to the back of my huge screen that I have here and the HDMI is completely hanging. Like it's broken <laughs> off in the socket. Oh no. <laughs> Just weird stuff, you know? Like Yeah, well, it's Murphy's Law. <laughs> oh, it completely is. Hi, Freya. So our the dog has decided to come join us. You know what? There is a surprising uh distribution of people who name their animals Freya. I've had three yeah. like in the last couple months that have been on the show. Oh wow. <laughs> well, but I know it's a very cats. common name, but um it's yeah. she's uh She's a, a Huskador. She's um, part Husky, part Labrador. Oh my gosh. And the, the eyes really sold it. Yeah. She needed a Nordic name, a, a good Nordic name. So. Oh my gosh, that's super cool. <laughs> that's super cool. Well, you may or may not know this, but I'm writing about Norse mythology. So wow. I'm writing about steampunk mixed with, with Norse mythology. And so that. Well, I know that you, your current thing was a, a steampunk um, project. But I didn't know that it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, so that's that's super fun, and I'm Wonderful. wishing I I named my cat Patsy Klein. <laughs> that's awesome. My wife would love that. She's a huge Patsy fan. Is she? Yeah. <laughs> super cool. Okay, well, I am so excited to get your take on the definition of different terms you create in. So, okay. I would say diesel punk. You are welcome okay. to talk about steampunk or whatever I might have missed there. But how do you how do you define these terms? And is there anything in bounds or out of bounds for you? Uh, no, I'm a lot less um, self constrained by genre than by content itself. Uh, you know, I think the, the way I kind of describe, especially um, my airship Daedalus uh, um, setting, is um, kitchen sink pulp. It's, it's, it's kind of classic pulp. It follows those tropes and those kind of rules. It kind of turns things on, on their head and, uh, nothing is off limits. Like basically anything that you could find in a pulp novel from the twenties through the forties, you'll find in one of my books, uh, probably all of them in one book. Um, everything from, air adventure to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, Cthulhu-esque horror, um, to, uh, sci-fi to, uh, you know, lost world kind of fantasy. Um, but I find a way to, to make it work and make it gel. Yeah. Um, I think the, the most accurate of the recent kind of labels to be thrown around is deco punk. Um, I see that as a subset of kind of diesel punk, which is, you know, post world war one, the, the interwar period basically and through world war two. Um, and, but deco punk being more stylistically oriented, more design, more, uh, and it's a little bit more optimistic, I think, um, a lot more with like, uh, alternate energy and, um, a, a more positive outlook, a more uh, a striving to do good, a little less of the greedy anti-hero, that kind of thing. I'm always thrilled to find someone who writes or creates in deco punk because that's mm -hmm. what I like writing oh, excellent. right now as well. So it's really cool to think about the different directions this mm -hmm. era can go in, like you said. So thank Sweet. you. And I'm so thrilled. Yes. <laughs> I think some people will ask what Daedalus means. Where did that come from? Sure, absolutely. Uh, the origin of Daedalus uh, comes from the Greek mythology. Uh, Daedalus was an engineer, a scientist. Um, he, um, he designed and built the Great Labyrinth, uh, 
where the uh, Minotaur was kept. Um, and he was also, he was imprisoned with his son Icarus. Um, and the way they were able to escape from their tower prison was Daedalus designed um, wings, flight harnesses with uh, wings from using actual bird feathers and wax to seal everything together and told, told Icarus, his son, okay, we're going to fly now. We got to get across the, across the water. Don't fly too close to the sun or the sun, the heat will melt the wax and you'll drop into the sea and you'll die. So they, they both took off and everything was going fine. Uh, and Icarus ignored his dad's wisdom <laughs> and flew too high. And the, the sun, the heat melted the wax. Icarus plunged to his death and Daedalus was the one that kept flying. So that always kind of resonated with me is that, you know, he, he knew what he was doing and that it seemed like a good moniker for, uh, for an experimental aircraft of the 1920s. Um, I agree. With an all electric drive system. And yeah, it's just, it, it's always resonated with me. Yeah, totally. And that's where we get that phrase flying too close to the sun and all that yes. good stuff. <laughs> So for anyone totally new to you, you've already sort of described the direction you go in, but can you take us through your work and the different hats you wear as well? Well, geez. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry, this isn't a four hour program, uh, but um, I basically anything that involves uh, writing fiction, uh, whether it be long form, short form, screenplay, comic, um, tabletop role-playing, you know, interactive fiction, video games. I've probably done it at one point or another. Um, uh, so in terms of my long form, which I think this is really what, what I'm working on mostly right now, uh, the Airship Daedalus setting, what I call the Aegis verse, because there's a, an organization within it called Aegis. Um, and, uh, it's kind of this growing, ever growing deco punk, uh, classic pulp, um, setting. And if you hear a little squeaky toy in the background, that's because my dog has a squeaky pink octopus that she likes to chew on. Oh, that's so, so yeah. Uh, airship Daedalus, uh, uh, like I said, it's kind of that, that kitchen seat pulp. Um, it, the, the core, uh, story centers around a couple, um, which is kind of fun to be writing uh, kind of a Nick and Nora Charles esque relationship uh, in, but with dire, you know, danger and horror and uh, action lurking around every corner um, has been a, a great challenge and also a lot of fun. I named them after my grandparents, two people now, now gone that um, made a profound impact on me creatively and, uh, uh, you know, just always kind of nurturing that creative side uh, as I was growing up. Do you mind telling us a little bit about them? Just, you know, very high level, maybe a story that kind of illustrates that influence they had. Sure. Just, uh, you know, basic, basic uh, background. My, my grandfather, Jack, um, uh, came from uh, an agricultural background. He grew up on a walnut farm in Southern California when oh. there were orchards in Southern California. <laughs> um, and, uh, he served in uh, the Navy in World War II in the Pacific theater, um, entered a pharmacist mate and came back a gunnery Lieutenant. Uh, and never once, I mean, he spent the war fighting the Japanese empire and he came back to the Bay area to be a, a educator and a school principal. Uh, in a very heavily uh, Asian uh, population. And never once when I was growing up did I ever hear any kind of racial slur or any kind of racist utterance from, from his lips. He was always positive. He was always uplifting. Um, just a really, really genuine, good soul. Um, my grandmother was an educator as well. She was, uh, uh, she, her background is just so like tragic as a young child, what she had to overcome. And, uh, 
and and how she made it through that that's that's a novel in and of itself so but yeah she just um and never let it get her down she was never fatalistic about anything she was always just very positive and upbeat and you know put your mind to it put your effort into it you can do anything and everything that's worth doing is going to it's going to be hard but it's going to pay off well, it's cool to get that background on these characters, or at least the namesakes. And I yeah. love that they had an influence on your creative life. Were they just very open and encouraging about that? Yes. I mean, from from the uh, as long as I can remember, I was always drawing uh, and and writing books, comics, or. Uh, children's books for my younger siblings or, you know, things like that. And we would go and spend time with them during the summers uh, when they retired to the Oregon coast. And, and we would just, we would go out on the sand dunes and, and uh, you know, ride the sand dunes and on sheets of uh, cardboard and go fishing, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, go camping, go uh, on road trips and, um, yeah, they were always encouraging, you know, projects. I would always have a project. What do you want to do during your stay? Well, I want to, I want to make this book. And so my grandmother would sit me down with, you know, all the materials I needed and okay, go to it. And she would help me with proofreading and stuff like that. It was just, it's, it sounds kind of odd in retrospect, but it was incredibly nurturing. Yeah. And very foundational. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Super cool. Okay. Well, um, as far as all these different creative projects you've stepped into as an adult, and uh, it's probably kind of hard to pick which of the things you love the most. You talked about the Airship Daedalus, but I also know you have a radio show and you've directed films and yep. just tons of stuff. So when it comes to thinking about your perfect day, you know, just <laughs> totally hypothetical. Which of those hats would you pick up first? Like, which would you be just so excited to step into if there were no, I mean, we're in a vacuum, there's no constraints. Wow. Um, yeah, because uh, constraints are really what keep you going, actually. Um, That's true. Orson, Orson Welles famously said, uh, the, um, what is it? The enemy of art is the absence of limitations. So, I mean, what he was saying was we need a boundary to push against. Without a boundary to push against, we get lazy and things just kind of fall apart through entropy. You need something pushing back against you in order to make you strong. Um, that's very it's, true. It, it's hard to feel that way sometimes, but yeah. I know that's true on some level as well, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, th I guess what I would say is if there's a paying gig, if I have a contract on the schedule, that's first, obviously. <laughs> Daddy's got to eat and pay the mortgage. So um, paid work comes first. But after that, uh, it really depends on where the, mu the, the muse leads. Um, I am very much a slave to the muse. And what she dictates, there I go. Um, it's It can be... I need to, you know, brush up on some some technical stuff. I, I need to do some research. I need to uh, plot out the next Daedalus novel. Um, I need to work on layout for the next uh, expansion for this uh, tabletop RPG line. It, it can be just about anything. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Thank you. I really appreciate yeah. it. And um, I'm also really excited because Todd is the first recipient of a question from my Patreon audience. Ooh. I just started Patreon recently at the time of this recording, but it was really fun to get my first question through Patreon. And just for anyone who doesn't know, it's at patreon.com forward slash story punks. So Tilly from Spokane asks, I want to do voiceover work, which Todd also does for anyone who doesn't know. And you can tell by his fabulous voice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's just <laughs> well, it's still media. coming through. It's still good. Um, but yeah, to continue, Tilly says, I'm not comfortable with my voice, though. So do you have any advice on how you worked on your voice if you did? And if you know how someone would go about that? Okay. Um, 
That is an incredibly good question. And it is probably very, very common amongst my fellow voice actors. I know I was uncomfortable with my voice for a long time. Uh, what gets you through that is just repetition, just, just doing a lot of work. Um, whether it be just training yourself, um, you know, reading, uh, doing your own audiobook, uh, reading, uh, you know, Shakespeare passages, um, and, and, you know, playing them back. Um, when I was a kid, my friends and I for years, uh, would create kind of sketch comedy, uh, on cassettes and we would actually <laughs> sell them amongst our friends. I mean, we were like nice. little entrepreneurs. <laughs> and, um, we, a lot of them revolved around this fictional radio station uh, in Santa Cruz when I was growing up, uh, and we would we would play different DJs and we had different characters that we did and stuff like that. And that kind of got us into the whole character character voices and making making voices distinct. Which actually also, I mean, forgive the the diversion here, but that can also help you as a writer. Yeah. Um, by making your your written characters distinct from one another, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I went from from <laughs> cassette comedy to uh, my stepdad uh, worked in radio, and uh, he brought me in just kind of as a one time deal. I ended up being a, a few times uh, to do some commercials. So I did. I played Indiana Jones in a a restaurant commercial yes. uh, when I was fourteen. <laughs> That would um, mean so much to a, a kid of that age. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, it was kind of a, I am of that age. <laughs> that was a, that was a big deal. <laughs> and then um, it was just, I, I kind of, I acted on stage quite a bit. I did some films. I got out of acting per se, or being on camera um, in favor of writing and directing. Uh, but then got back into stage uh, in West Seattle, there was a arts charity that I was involved with for about 10 years called 12th Night Productions. And they're a, a mentorship uh, and community development theater group. And it wasn't until about five years ago that I actually got an agent. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's been a, a long, <laughs> strange trip. <laughs> Very circuitous. So he did voices for video games in the industry. and and that kind of thing. But it's, it's really just down to repetition. If you want to do voiceover work to get to the, the point where you are comfortable with your own voice, you have to be able to listen over and over and over. I would definitely look, look into classes and look into workshops. I, I definitely uh, took advantage. Can you hear the squeaky octopus? I just heard, I wasn't sure if Freya was whining or, but that dog, I mean, she That's can do the octopus. Her eyes, you know? <laughs> uh, yes, anyway, workshops are a good idea. Those can be very, very helpful. Okay, Story Punks, I always feel bad tearing you away from part one, but it just means there's more in store, and I'm really excited to share the conclusion of what we talk about in part two. And for my intermission between these two episodes, I just want to mention for, you know, how many people download this show, how many people are out there in this Story Punks audience that we're growing together. Basically, if everybody chipped in at least $1, but maybe $2, for some of you or three dollars for some of you just to kind of bridge in the gaps we would actually be able to reach that goal immediately so that's part of why i chose the one thousand dollar goal because i knew that if everybody chipped in and if some people were a little extra generous we would actually hit that one thousand dollar mark and so i thought it was a great goal to reach for and also frankly it's what it would take to cover the costs or you know at least at least make it so that I'm not absolutely losing a lot of ground through all the time it takes to put this show together. I would love if you would be one of those people that can chip in a tip over at patreon.com forward slash storypunks. 
However you listen to this show or however you're part of this community though, I absolutely appreciate it. Thank you. And if money's tight, just remember you can always go leave a review. That is so helpful, especially on iTunes because there's stuff going on with the algorithms and that's how they you know, present the show to new people and that's how the show grows. So again, if you want directions on how to do that, please go to storypunks.world forward slash review. And I do truly appreciate you and hope that this show is delivering value and inspiration to you weekly, at least as long as I can sustain it (laughs) at our current growth level. So other than that, let's break away and I hope you'll join back with episode 58 when you get a chance. I'm wishing you the best with all your projects in the meantime.